Please be seated. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the uh, 2012 commencement for the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. And I would like to call up Catherine Lauren uh, Hoberling, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to please stand as we sing the national anthem. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming? whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the Our, our graduates, not only are they smart and hardworking, but they are talented. Thank you, Catherine. Again, please. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Glenn McDonald, and I have the, the honor and the, the pleasure of being the director of the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. And I must say that I thank all of you for joining us here in what is absolutely the pinnacle and high point of our academic career. And it just uh, fills all of us with pride, as I'm sure it must fill all of you with pride. So go ahead and give them a big round of applause. Now, I know there are parents out here. I know there are families, there's friends who have been through them, through the, been through our graduating class through the high points, the low points, wrote a few checks, ran a few Visa and MasterCard charges, et cetera, et cetera, maybe co-signed a few loans. Folks, you have to give, the graduating class, you have to give a big round of applause to those who have been with you, your family and friends. Now, having a daughter who graduated from the UC last year, I know for a lot of the, su the support, the family, the friends out there, this is a great big exhale, right? I mean, they made it, they're through. Maybe the old bank account is going to get padded up again. This is a wonderful, wonderful occasion. And then when the glow of today wears off, you're going to think, what next, right? OK, what next? And I'm going to tell you, I don't think you have much to worry about with this group here. I think you do not have much to worry about. Not only are they talented, gifted, hardworking, and absolutely impeccably educated, uh, if I do, I have a biased view, a group of, group of individuals, but I, I think the future looks, looks very, very good for them. And let's, let's think about a few things. First of all, They've come through what is a very, very difficult program, very, very hard sciences, very hard maths, and then they have to start thinking about public policy, social sciences, the application of those skills. And then they top it all off working for a year on a practicum project, a real world project with a corporate clients, government agencies, NGOs. Not a book report, but a real life project. I'm very pleased to say that the practicum projects this year made the UCLA Newsline 
And they were one of this week's top emailed news stories from UCLA about the wonderful research these students here have just completed. Let's give them a big hand. So, so folks, they're going to hit the ground running, not just with a good education, but with some real world experience. And if we take a look out there, the growth of clean tech, green industry, and more and more corporations uh, putting in sustainability programs, environmental programs, oftentimes reporting directly to the vice president or presidents or CEOs of those corporations, I think that there's a pretty bright future out there. Investment in clean tech, green tech, and sustainable technologies since 2008 has been one of the bright areas in the investment world and one of the bright areas for California's economy. Do you know that we are ranked number one, no, without any rival in terms of clean tech and, and uh, sustainability technology investment in the United States, about an order of magnitude, this is California, about an order of magnitude more than our nearest rival, Massachusetts. We are one of the hubs in the world for developing not just clean technologies, but clean policies, uh, strategies for the corporate and private sector, et cetera. There's a lot of demand out there. And we've just done our first survey of students who left the program. Remember, this is a new major, only about five, six years old. We've done our first exit survey, and we found it's a good news, bad news story for you guys out there, for the parents out there. Good news is about 85% of our graduates have found positions either in uh, private sector, NGOs, or government related to their degree. That's the good news. Uh, but part of that 85% is or they have gone on to graduate school, okay? <laughs> and so, and I know, a few, I know a few of them because I've been writing letters of recommendation are going on to graduate schools. Which graduate schools? We've had students going to Columbia. We've had students going to Harvard. We've had students going to Stanford. We've had students going to all the UCs. Really, really fine graduate schools, but also, and this is where you can you know, exhale a little bit, Lots of opportunity uh, outside of school as well. And looking at the practicum projects, looking at this class, how well they've performed, I think the future looks very, very bright for them indeed. I do want to say, though, if they are thinking about graduate programs, I'm very pleased to announce a few things. First of all, this is our biggest graduating class ever. Every year the major has grown and we are very, very pleased to see we're taking yet more rows up and there's a few more of you that have to be in the standing room only seats up there. So the major's growing and as our institute is growing, we are this year as of July 1 adding a doctoral program. And so we will have a doctoral program in environmental sciences and engineering just like the program you guys took, there will be a strong emphasis on practical experience working outside of the university. And this is a very uh, esteemed program which was on campus and has felt that it should be moved to the institute as we have grown. So part of our growth and part of our success is really due to you. It's due to the fine students that we have. Not only on campus do I hear great things about you, do I see you all involved in things, but when I go out and I go to government offices, work in the private sector, I'll have people come up and say, you may not remember me, I was in your environmental change class, I graduated with your degree. You guys are getting out there, build that network amongst yourselves, treasure your friends, keep close to them, meet the other people who've gone before you, and help the new graduate students who are gonna come out in the years ahead. There will be class after class like you, larger. You will be in positions of power and influence. You'll be in positions to mentor them and bring them along. Right now you're going to help yourselves. Later on you're going to help the next generation. And I know you are going to do an excellent job with that responsibility. And think about us. You know, stay in touch with us through Facebook. Stay in touch with us. If we can help you, if you can, if you can help us in the future, which I'm sure a few of you are going to be, you know, the next, uh, the next Warren Buffett's out there in the clean tech sector, do, do remember that as well and, and help the next generation of students. You guys were the pioneers. You're amongst the first, you know, very few graduating classes. And we are so proud of you. You have been just remarkable pioneers. 
Ladies and gentlemen, you should be proud of them. I cannot tell you how much they have achieved. Let's give them one more round of applause. Now, we have a very, very distinguished um, uh, commencement speaker who has very kindly come in here, is on his way to the Rio 20 conference this afternoon, but made time for you, and I know has been very, very impressed. And so, to introduce that speaker, I would like to introduce to you our new associate director, Dr. Mark Gould, who for 20 years was uh, in the leadership of Heal the Bay and was indeed the president of Heal the Bay, who has rejoined the UCLA community from where he got his doctorate degree to become our associate director and a faculty member with the uh, institute. He is going to introduce our very, very exciting, notable, and I would say famous uh, uh, commencement speaker. May I ask Mark Gould to come to the stage? Good morning. It's uh, my pleasure to welcome, uh, as our commencement speaker, a very good friend of mine and a true environmental hero, uh, Mr. Terry Taminen. Um, Terry's successes over the years have been nothing short of extraordinary, and he's led in so many different sectors. I first got to know Terry uh, when he became the very first Santa Monica Bay keeper. Um, in essence, the first aqua cop for Santa Monica Bay. And in that, in that role, he did everything from write uh, testimony and appear before legislative bodies and, and regulatory agencies to actually collecting samples in clandestine operations from auto scrap yards in the middle of the night. That's how Terry started um, in, in the environmental field. Um, he moved from there to become a, a board member of the Waterkeeper Alliance, as well as the head of an environmental foundation called Environment Now, which is a local foundation that largely works in the California area. Um, so he worked on water, forestry, and many other different issues. Climate change became a big focus. Um, but as a board member of the Waterkeeper Alliance, he worked with Bobby Kennedy Jr., among other people, to actually grow this movement to now, there's almost 200 waterkeepers globally that are fighting for clean water on every continent other than Antarctica. I don't think they set one up there yet. Um, uh, in, on the entire globe. And so that movement has really had a huge influence on water issues and water quality protection um, globally. So quite extraordinary. From Environment Now, um, he was the, the first major environmental leader to back um, uh, then gubernatorial candidate, Arnold Schwarzenegger, in his bid to become governor. He actually helped write his environmental action platform. Um, and as a result, he ended up becoming uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's uh, secretary of Cal EPA, um, where he did an extraordinary job using the bully pulpit of that to really move forward in a huge way California on some of the things that Glenn was talking about, on moving California as a, a leader in green tech on climate change. I can honestly say, without Terry's leadership and the leadership of Fran Pavley and the leadership of the governor, um, that we would not had the and Mary Nichols as well, the groundbreaking Assembly Bill 32, which is making California a global leader in reducing greenhouse gases um, here in California, and that's finally going to start in earnest um, in the next year to two years. And a lot of that had to do with Terry's leadership. He went from the state of California, I guess the bureaucracy might have been a little too much, um, to, to then still work full time on the climate change issue um, and helped create um, the R20 network, of which he's going to Rio um, in the next few hours uh, to meet with those folks, with the understanding that nations weren't doing enough to solve the biggest environmental crisis that we have before us right now, which is climate change, and that we needed the regions, whether they were states or provinces to really show the way to the rest of the world on how we can move forward on reducing greenhouse gases so we can protect not only your generation, but generations in the future from the harms and perils of climate change. Um, so Terry has worked on that. He's worked on the green investment arena, and he's remained uh, very involved in the environmental community in California, even as he's expanded his environmental reach globally. It is my pleasure to introduce my good friend, Terry Taminen, 
who I guarantee you will give you a very inspirational speech. I've seen him speak many times before. Our great California environmental leader, Terry Tamanen. Thank you, Mark. That was a remarkable introduction. Uh, you know, during the American Civil War, the Times of London had a correspondent in New York who was sending back lurid tales from the Civil War battlefield. They couldn't believe them. But, you know, in those days, there was no way to independently check it out. They didn't have Facebook. So, uh, so they went ahead and they did publish these stories from the American Civil War, but just in case it wasn't correct, they would publish these stories under the banner, Important If True. And, and so it is with my bio. Um, you know, before I get into my comments, and by the way, I want to thank Mark uh, and Glenn and Madeline Glickfeld, who are just wonderful heroes of mine. Uh, you know, Mark in particular, when we started working together, he was working on his doctorate here at UCLA and, and volunteered to be at Heal the Bay. And, and they needed a water quality person, and he just volunteered because they had no money. And then they started giving him, you know, scraps of food left over in the kitchen. And then, you know, finally a, a couple of bucks, and, and he just thought he was stealing to be actually paid to do this kind of work. And next thing you know, he just moved up uh, the, the organization and turned it into one of the most effective, dollar for dollar, pound for pound, action for action, organizations in the entire country. Heal the Bay is just absolutely remarkable, and thanks to him, I met my wife, Leslie. So uh, I, owe Mark, <laughs> I, I owe Mark a lot. And Madeline, of course, will tell you stories about 30 years ago when I was her pool boy. That was part of my, that was part of my resume. Yeah, yeah, think about that for a moment. Go ahead. Let your mind wander. Um, before I get, in, before I get into to my remarks, though, I just, I, I'm sitting here looking out at all of you. Would you all just look around at yourselves? You know, I give talks all over the world. If I was giving this talk today in China, every face in this room would be Chinese. If I was giving this talk in Brazil, everybody would be Brazilian. I'm telling you, look around. Every country is represented, every ethnicity, every, both genders. I mean, look at these flags. You represent this. True diversity. This is California, but these are the people that are going to have to solve these, these issues around the world. And UCLA has made this possible and gotten you the platform to work together. So I just want to thank and congratulate UCLA. <laughs> Truly remarkable. Now, I was surfing the web recently and thinking about what I was going to talk to you about. And I came across a website from a tourist website from Australia where Americans were asking questions about Australia, and some of them were so stupid that the purveyors of this very serious website could only give humorous answers. And there, I just want to read you a couple of them, because they have, they have something to do with our, our topics today. Um, so here's the first one. Question, I have never seen it rain in Australia on TV. How do the plants grow? <laughs> Answer, we import the plants fully grown and then just sit around watching them die. Question, can you give me some information about hippopotamus racing in Australia? <laughs> Answer, Africa is the big triangle-shaped continent south of Europe. Australia is the big island in the middle of the Pacific, which does not have, oh, forget it. Sure, the hippo racing is every Tuesday night, come naked. <laughs> and the last one, probably my favorite, is which direction is north in Australia? And the answer was, face south, then turn 180 degrees, contact us when you get here, and we'll send you the rest of the directions. <laughs> now, I mention these because while they're funny, they really do exemplify what I think is the real problem we have with trying to deal with this challenge of building sustainable communities for the future. Too many people just don't understand the world we live in today. But you can forgive them because even those of us engaged in green studies or sustainable businesses can't always see the proverbial forest for the trees. So the question is, is there a way to help our communities see clearly, to inspire and lead the way to a more sustainable future? Well, when I lived in Nigeria, I met a tribal elder in a tiny coastal village who told me a tale that perhaps could answer that question. He said, imagine you have just washed up on a tiny, deserted island. The island is no bigger than 10 steps in every direction, and there's nothing more than solid rock. 
Waves are constantly pounding the shore, which leaves you no opportunity to fish or harvest from the tide pools. There's no fresh water, and you are utterly alone except for one living thing, a lone palm tree. Now, it is a coconut palm, so it provides some food and drink. A bird lays an egg now and then that further supplements your meager diet. You notice a dozen coconuts on the ground and several dozen more up in the crown of the tree in various stages of ripeness. And you use a sharp rock to remove the husk and crack open one coconut and you devour the meat and drink within, careful to preserve the shell and make two small cups to store water when it does rain. And given this reprieve, you sit in the sh under the shade of the tree, the only place on the island where you are protected from baking into parchment, and you begin to ponder your fate. You recognize the only way to, to assure a sustainable supply of food and water, you can only consume coconuts as they fall from the tree. By limiting yourself to the fallen coconuts, you know the tree will provide you sustenance indefinitely. You calculate how many are likely to fall, over what period of time, and then determine how many days each fallen coconut must last to stretch out the supply for the foreseeable future. Some nights are cold and wet and windy, but you're smart enough not to cut down the tree and burn its wood for warmth. Instead, you burn only fronds that have fallen and dried naturally. You husband these precious resources carefully, burning only a small amount of fuel at a time to ensure a sustainable supply for all of the cold, wet, windy nights yet to come. Each fire is not as robust as you would like, but you want your supplies to last a very long time. Now, you could probably get by in this manner for many weeks, months, maybe even years until you're rescued. But the point is, you thought about it and you figured out how to live from the natural resources at hand by harvesting what the island could afford and nothing more. Why can't industrial man do likewise? Is it the herd mentality? We might easily learn the sustainable yield of this island when we're alone on it, but living with billions of others on a somewhat larger island we call Earth, are we misguided into consuming more than we really need and certainly more than our Earth island can provide? Indeed, industrial man consumes like it's a race, as if there was a, a prize for consumption itself like the pie-eating contest at the county fair. We don't see the incremental losses from one generation to the next. Each generation accepts as normal the state of affairs they inherit from which they feel it's acceptable to take their fair share of resources of a palm tree that is disappearing before our very eyes. So, for example, while we've drained or paved 95% of the coastal wetlands in California, this generation still issues permits to drain or pave more, speaking only of the percentage that a particular development or proposal would eliminate from today's remaining acreage, rather than seeing we've already given up so much that we cannot afford the, to bear the loss of one more acre, one more palm frond, one more coconut. Whatever the reason, evidence of this thing, this phenomenon that I call eco-amnesia, is all around us. Our species is actually working against sustainable communities because of this. I mean, for example, why do we name our communities and high schools after wild animals even as we're destroying their habitat? Why do we pave over these last few acres of wetlands and then call the housing development, development that replaces it Sandpiper Ridge? In California, we have countless sports teams named for the grizzly bear, and a grizzly even adorns our state flag but we hunted it to extinction in California a century ago. So what is the cure for this eco-amnesia? How do we begin to see our planet as an island with limited resources instead of a business in liquidation where everything must go to the highest bidder as quickly as possible? Well, in Jewish tradition, the scribe who writes the Torah, which is the Jewish instructions for life, uses a traditional ink that's designed to be erasable so the parchment can be washed clean and a new generation of scribes can write the Torah, thus assuring the passage of the learning through the ages. Learning something new is therefore said to be writing on washed paper. We can learn from this. We must wash old ideas from our minds and have an open mind about new ideas of sustainability. And as those humorous questions from the tourists to Australia highlight, the first place to open our minds and open our eyes and hearts is to understand the scope of the problem we're facing. 
Former Vice President Dan Quayle once said, it isn't pollution that's harming the environment, it's the impurities in the air and water that's doing it. <laughs> he actually said that. <laughs> but of course, William Shakespeare probably said it better when he said, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune, but omitted, and all of life's voyage is bound in shallows in miseries and regrets. And I pose to you that we are afloat upon such a sea at this moment, and it's our obligation, indeed it's our opportunity, to shape that tide and shape our future before it shapes us. We can wash away old ideas about what it means to be sustainable and find new opportunities and new resources for this generation and those yet to come. Now this may sound impossible, but you don't need to be a rocket scientist or a climate scientist to see that the things we need to do to meet our environmental challenges are the same thing we need to do to meet our economic future challenges. Let me give you a real world example of this, a way that a smart community just a few miles north of where we're sitting today has washed away old thinking to become truly sustainable. Home to about 8,000 people and some light industrial businesses, Sun Valley sits at the base of the mountain range and was flooded every year in the rainy season as the waters concentrated from 100 streams and flowed together right through this little town. Los Angeles County drew up a plan to build new storm sewers that would efficiently drain the water into the Pacific Ocean. Now, of course, that water would be contaminated with oil and pesticide and heavy metals and everything else it picked up while flowing over the typical urban environment. But the residents of Sun Valley were thrilled about ending this flooding until they heard the cost, $50 million, a price tag that this very modest community simply couldn't afford. And then a clever city planner asked a simple question. What if we went back to square one? What if we washed away the old thinking and reimagined this project? Would we intentionally spend money to dump polluted water into the ocean? Would we intentionally waste billions of gallons of, wa of water at a time we're spending billions of dollars more in precious energy to ship water hundreds of miles from Northern California to Southern California to meet our needs for drinking and irrigation water? So instead, he drew up a plan to remodel a dilapidated city park, putting huge cisterns beneath a new set of sports fields and picnic areas. Water could be drained into these cisterns, some recharging the underground wells, and the rest used for civic landscape watering. The city could pay for the project by selling excess water to its neighbors. The revenue would pay for a new park, the solution to the flooding, and a permanent source of revenue to the town. Well, the project was completed. Land values increased near the fabulous new park and the city prospered while solving a massive problem. The net result is that Sun Valley now captures 8,000 acre feet of water a year, four times the needs of its residents, and it has a great new source of revenue and redevelopment projects at no net cost to the taxpayers. The lesson from Sun Valley is that we can succeed not by remodeling our communities first, but by remodeling our thinking first. That dilapidated park was not a polluted brown field to be ignored, but actually a great community asset, a blank canvas to a creative water planner. Yes, we can save water and energy too by remodeling our thinking. California utility executives tell me privately that they worry about seeing even a few hundred electric cars in any one city if the owners begin installing those 440 volt fast chargers to get the batteries to charge up faster. But consider this. The Empire State Building in New York just retrofit its lights and its windows and added some insulation, and it's now saving 40% of their energy as a result. The Sears Tower, now called the Willis Tower in Chicago, did the same thing, but they also upgraded their heating and air conditioning systems and elevator motors, and they also added some wind turbines to the roof to generate clean energy, and they're saving 80% of their current energy bills, 80%. So without upgrading the grid, you could install a lot of car chargers with that spare capacity in Chicago or New York, and you could do the same thing here in LA. Now, of course, conservation alone won't solve our sustainability challenges. We do need to evolve beyond things like our dependence on fossil fuels to something sustainable for powering our buildings and transportation. So that creates a question of, could we actually completely switch to those sustainable fuels and away from the limited polluting fossil fuels entirely? Well, consider that more sunlight falls on the Earth every hour 
than is needed to power all human energy needs for a year. And add to this the potential of biomass, geothermal, tidal power, wind, and other renewables, I'd say it's clear that there is enough clean renewable energy resources if only we deploy the technology to use them. And to those who say, well, those technologies to harness clean fuels is still too expensive, especially when our economies are struggling, let me tell you about a small business in Sacramento, OCR Roofing. OCR was faced with laying off 100 workers because of the slowdown in the housing market. But now they're retraining those crews and hiring more workers to keep up with the demand for new solar installations. By thinking green, they're still growing, even in a down economy. And they're keeping people working in jobs they'll be proud of for generations to come. Now, of course, there are many complex solutions to our wasteful habits, to the climate crisis, to our shrinking supply of natural resources, to our fossil fuel addiction and the pain it's caused. But in the end, Igniting this fundamental shift in thinking will not be up to companies or governments alone. It will also depend on the commitment of each of us as individuals. So who will be the first to say that I can live with a little less, that my children will have a little more? Who among us will be the first to say my life will not only be measured by the number on the bottom of a balance sheet, but by the balance of clean air and clean water and healthy landscapes that I bequeath to my children? Who among us will be the first to teach our children to answer the call to action that rang out across this land five decades ago when a president of these United States challenged us to ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country? Well, I put it to you that today you are answering that call. The things that you are doing, the studies that you've encountered and, and engaged in, the degrees you're going to receive today, the careers you're going to go on to are the most patriotic things you could possibly do. And if this is the day that others follow that same call to action that you are, if this is the day we act upon it by discovering more sun valleys and empire state buildings, if this is the day we show others how to do it, then this will be the day we begin to cure eco-amnesia and the day we all graduate. Graduate to a world with a secure, sustainable economic and environmental future for this generation and those yet to come. Thank you for what you've done and what you're about to do and good luck. Well, you have your charge. Let's thank Terry again for a brilliant speech. I mean, Terry. Now, I have the big shoes to follow, but I have, I have a lot of faith in our next speaker. Uh, and this will be the student speaker for today, and it was Tor Zipkin. So can I ask Tor to please come on up? Hello, everybody. Uh, okay. <laughs> I want to start off saying, uh, Terry kind of mentioned it in his uh, speech but I'm gonna start talking about uh, a huge canvas. All right, imagine a huge canvas. This canvas has never been bare. It has always had a painting on it. As a child, the painting was complete. It looked as if it came out of a picture book or a movie. It could have had an outdoor scene at a lake with a tire swing or a rocket floating into space. As you grew older, the picture on the canvas would naturally change. Landscapes would change, the, theme, the themes would be different, and it would always be morphing into something new. Nothing was constant. Yet as you grew older, the picture would begin to fade away, and it would be up to you to create your own painting. Eventually, you will be given a bare canvas with nothing on it, and what gets painted depends 100% on you. While this may not happen immediately after college, this canvas will inevitably be given to all of us and choice is the paint we use. What then do you do with this canvas, and how does it relate to environmental science? Fellow students, proud parents, and distinguished faculty, uh, it is my honor to speak with you today about a culminating senior year of college and why it was so special. I was pleasantly surprised how much I enjoyed my Friday morning's fall quarter to begin <laughs> our capstone senior projects. What we discussed in class was not only interesting, it was the first time I saw applied environmental science. It was a great way to bond and relate to your fellow classmates, making new friends that will last a lifetime. These Friday classes meant a lot to me, for they embodied what it means to have the best possible senior year. We had a great teacher, class full of laughter, and saw people doing what they love. 
providing us with both confidence and comfort. This was only the first quarter with two more to come. It is safe to say we had no idea what was next and what it would ultimately do and mean to us. The next part of our class is what makes our major so special and so unique. For those that don't know, senior year environmental majors work on real environmental issues for clients all throughout the Los Angeles area. You get put into a group with people you don't know and undertake something long term, something many have never done before. Most of college is an individual effort. You write your own essays about your own ideas. How well you do on your own test depends on how much you studied. Getting put into a group with others for such a large project meant you would have to collaborate, make compromises, and expand on ideas that were not your own. Having to work in the group dynamic to achieve something bigger is special for what it will be doing in the years to, for it is what we will be doing in the years to come. It's the best representation and introduction to the real world. When you work with others, you are given the opportunity to learn about yourself. Winter quarter was hard because we were formulating our initial proposals to address our respective clients' questions. We were not given much and had little direction. It was up to the group to create a viable experiment or study. In my group, it was taking really long to decide what tree measurements should be taken <laughs> to indicate differences between samples. It was constant back and forth and constant re-examination. My frustration got the best of me, and in my mind, it was time to make a decision. We all push for what we think should be done. However, no longer was I pushing. I made it clear what measurements we should take, why there were the right measurement measurements, and why the others weren't. I was being critical and at times closed-minded, yet to me this was justified in the name of a productive and efficient group. Yet this is how you grow. About a week later, my advisor gave me the perspective of this group. There was nothing wrong with my ideas or my work ethic, but I had to work on my communication skills. Me lacking these important skills made it unenjoyable for others and in turn led to counterproductivity. I had to make a personal change. I became more flexible and understanding. I worked on not being so forceful when conveying my ideas. Not only did this help the group, it helped me as well. The opportunity to work in a group like we did in 180 is special because of the skills it teaches us. Beyond college, no matter where you go or what you do, life is a team effort. Working together with others to achieve a larger goal is how progress is made. Our senior project was the best glimpse of what is to come and how tasks and projects are completed. The ability to incorporate yourself into a group is the ability to be successful. Alumni Day was great because it showed me the importance of 180 and what it gives to us. Daniel Mabasa is an environmental alum, wherever he is, uh, and uh, he works at Menlo Park Google campus. Daniel is a community manager, and he told us what Google liked about him was the experience he had working on his senior research project. To Google, he was the right person because he knew, or they knew, he had the experience navigating this group dynamic. The 180 senior projects are so helpful to us as students because they give us this head start. 180 gives us, gives us what employers are looking for when hiring new employees and asks themselves, can this person not only contribute to the group, but can they work together with them to create an entity that is greater than the sum of the parts? All right, so I'll bring this back to the canvas. Our senior 180 projects are so great because in multiple ways they help us navigate the daunting task of painting an elaborate picture from scratch. This year we were given relatively bare canvases and it was up to us to create something complete. We were not told what to do, just to do. We had little guidance and little to work with other than ourselves, yet we managed to create paintings that others will appreciate. We gained important skills that are needed when painting this picture, and we learned about ourselves to ensure the best possible picture. When we are now given a canvas with absolutely nothing on it, we will be more prepared to create something out of nothing. So I have so far talked about what our major does for the individual, but what about the individuals themselves? Meeting new people brings happiness, and when they share similar interests, life is good. We seniors have such a monumental year, not only because of what we accomplished, but also because who we met along the way. The environmental science major is small, and you grow close with those you normally would have not known. It is a platform to meet an amazing array of individuals with amazing talents and ways of living life. American car restorers, fraternity presidents, concert directors, big wave surfers, Club founders, slackliners, bike enthusiasts, only make up a few of these incredible individuals, all with their own hobbies, endeavors, and styles. You find people to talk to, be it about environmental issues and beyond. The IOES class of 2012 made my college experience infinitely more enjoyable, for there is no way to quantify what happens here. This is a special mixture of people, a blend of intellectuals, entrepreneurs, and humanitarians, 
and they are who defines environmental science. So in conclusion, let us revisit this canvas one more time. This time, not about, we won't be looking about the paintings we help create in our groups, but we will be looking at the painting we call environmental science and the IOES. How rewarding is it to say you contributed to something so young yet so developed? How as a class we have bettered an already beautiful painting? We started this year off with a painting that was looking good. A meadow with tall grass flowing in the wind, a rock wall in the background, and the setting sun. Yet it is not done, Bob Ross is still going. He reaches for his brush and starts applying a deep green in a seemingly random manner. Delicate touch, he says, delicate touch. It takes a second, but when you step back, out of nowhere, you see a gorgeous forest. We have added to the IOES in the same manner, something so small and unpredictable, yet when looking at the final project, we realize how much it has contributed to an amazing painting. Now ask yourself, what did you get out of being an environmental science major? Reflect on what this year has meant to you, and ask yourself what you can do to give the future environmental seniors to make their experience last a lifetime. As those who have had this exciting experience, what can, we do to, what can we do to construct something just as satisfying for others? We should take what we learned from the IOES and spread it outwards. We should continue being the special people we are because we're environmental science majors. We should let the world know what it means to have this honor and opportunity. Thank you all. Congratulations, 2012 Seniors Environmental Science. All right. Uh, thank you. Tor, th thank you very, very much. And, and thank you for representing your, your classmates in the class so well. It was excellent. Let's give Tor another hand. We are now going to have the presentation of Certificates of Appreciation for Education for Sustainable Living Program Leaders. And so Carl Mayada and Cully Norby will come up and present for us. Uh, the Education for Sustainable Living program here at UCLA that's run through the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability is a student-initiated, student-led uh, organization that connects undergraduates to the world of sustainability. And the program consists of two components, a speaker series in the fall and action research teams in winter and spring. Uh, in fall quarter, the students invite speakers, they run the class, lead discussions, and they help educate their peers about sustainability. This class is open to all students on campus, and it's a remarkably effective way of engaging and educating students um, all, in all majors on the campus. In the action research teams, um, this is very similar to the, the practicum that the environmental science uh, seniors conduct in their year, but the students form small teams to research issues of campus sustainability including energy efficiency, transportation, waste stream management, uh, sustainable food practices, health system practices, recreation facilities, and on and on. Each team is paired with a campus stakeholder, and the students work collaboratively with that client. So not only does the campus benefit, but as Tor talked about for the practicum, these students are learning valuable professional skills as well. And this remarkable program um, has really helped to transform this campus. It was initiated by students uh, five years ago, and it has served as a catalyst for change. And these students are pushing all of us, pushing the campus to do better, to think more boldly. And it's become a crucial part of creating a truly sustainable UCLA, where we're actually practicing what we teach these students. As a public institution, it's UCLA's responsibility to demonstrate that we can achieve a sustainable society when that's environmentally sound, economically feasible, and socially just and equitable. And this ESLP program has taken us a long way down that road. So we're here today to um, recognize the student leaders of that program for this year. Thank you, Kelly. And of course, this could not have been possible without the creative intelligence, the sustained energy and leadership of uh, five of our uh, leaders who have exerted uh, incredible energy since last spring, so for a full year, and I'd like to ask them to come up right now. I think we have three of our five leaders here. Uh, so we have uh, Chelsea Williams, Aaron, Aaron, 
Aaron Berlin. Jasneet Baines, are you here, Jasneet? And uh, the, other, the other two are Nina Gupta and Claire Josephson. And I know that Nina will be with us uh, later outside. So come on up. Start with Chelsea Williams. Thank you so much. And let's see, Jasneet's not here, Claire's not here, but Aaron Berlin is here. So let's give it up for our awardees there. Now I'm, I'm very pleased to, uh, to call upon uh, uh, Dr. Travis Longcore, who will present some of our academic awards and distinctions. Travis, please. Um, thank you. Um, thanks, Tor. Um, I'd first like to uh, present the Outstanding Academic Achievement Award. Uh, the faculty select this award based on the combination of uh, both the grades you got in the courses you took and the courses that you chose to complete at UCLA. We considered 12 finalists for the award, all of which whom have uh, demonstrated consistent high achievement uh, overall and in the major. We are very proud of, of these uh, nominees, as it were. It was a very difficult decision, ultimately. And I want to recognize here each of the nominees for the award um, and, and have them uh, known for that. Uh, stand up as I read your name. Devin Bullock. <laughs> Yesenia Chow. <laughs> Nauman Charania. <laughs> Tina Wang. <laughs> Serena Lau. Brianna Lawrence, Christian Lim, Amanda Martin, Jason Miller, Jacob Palmquist, Cheyenne Seati, and I'd like to welcome up to the stage to accept the uh, award for academic achievement in environmental science, the man with the forest on his head, Justin Penn. Our next award is the Outstanding uh, Service Award. Uh, this award recognizes the student who's most deeply and consistently contributed to environmental science through service to the community and in the field. We again had a very difficult choice with six nominations, and I'd like to recognize each of them before announcing the winner of the award. I had no idea when I was teaching that these students were doing all these things on the side in addition uh, to the senior practicum, but they were. So, uh, in no particular order here, I'd like to recognize for her volunteer research on water quality and commitment to river and beach health, Rocia Flores. <laughs> for his uh, leadership on the issue of climate change effects on mountain environments and many other efforts, uh, Chris Holtz. <laughs> for spearheading the student-generated website Climatepedia, Justin Ong. For her research on the chemical basis for prey detection in sea stars, Nancy Tu. And you guys can sit down, thank you. Because um, I'm going to call the next person up here. 
Uh, we decided to recognize a runner-up this year uh, as a student who's worked on sustainability in the coffee industry in Costa Rica, worked with the World Wildlife Fund on climate adaptation projects in Africa, worked on plans to improve the sustainability <laughs> of development patterns for a small island in the Philippines, and has introduced hundreds of students to the outdoors and appreciation for nature through guiding many UCLA recreation trips, and our runner-up is Dennis Mabasta. <laughs> And uh, finally, the recipient of the Outstanding Service Award uh, volunteered over 350 hours with Circle K and brought new environmental service projects to that organization, was a two-year participant in the action research teams, helping test and implement the composting program at Hitch Suites and leading the Hill Energy Metering Project, served as treasurer and intern with the Alliance to Save Energy's Green Campus Program, working with faculty and staff members to implement a variety of energy efficiency projects on campus, including energy audits of all the buildings on the hill and foam hood energy com competitions in the chemistry lab, resulting in hundreds of kilowatt hours, uh, hundreds of thousands of kilowatt hours saved, and volunteering her senior year at the Center for Tropical Research, serving as the RA for the sustainable, sustainability theme uh, community on campus. She just got back from a volunteer research trip uh, doing some ornithology work in the Pacific Northwest, I'd like to congratulate Serena Lau for all she has done. They're going to come this way, and they're going to come right across the front of you here. Okay. Graduates, environmental science class of 2012. Taylor Zispain. Brett Charles Bova. Natalie Beth Marte. Amanda Nicole Martin. Ryan Michael Sokolovsky. Kyle Patrick Cernelia. Christopher Kevin Holtz. Justin Penn. I love you. Where's your card? I don't have one. All right. You know my name. I know, but we need a card for you. Don't forget. Tor Zipkin. Dennis G. Mabasa. Serena Lau. Catherine Herberling. Aaron Berlin. Brittany Labor. Jared Block. Casey Lawrence Scopel. Peter Slowick. Anurag Jawar. Jacob Martin Palmquist. Veronica Mota. 
Rocio Flores. Kimberly Aguirre. Brittany Nelson. Nancy Lynn Tu. Alex Noring. Luke Eisenhart. Misa Victoria Downey. Kirsty Ann Rupert. Molly Cornfield. Michelle Honda. Jason Lloyd Miller. Brittany Chow. Edgar Vargas. Michael Glass. Nauman Charania. Christian Johnson. Cheyenne Seadi. Calvin Q. Margaret Mackey. Devin Bullock. Clifford Shum. Ryan Nagy. Thank you. Gunit Kohli. Karen Kim Vu. Kerry Smith. Nilufar Modiri. Tina Wang. Melissa Chin. Tessa Reeder. Ashton Yoon. Cheryl Parsons. Brianna Lee Lawrence. Raul Gaina. Michael Bordeaux. Natasha Patel. Ying Ying, Ying Kai. Harriet Torosian. Akhtar Masood. Shotaro Yamada. Jessica Tian Chen. Yesenia Chow. Charles Lei.
Christian Lim. <laughs> Rogelio Pardo. <laughs> Melissa Traverso. <laughs> Fabrice Quintaldi Quito. Andrew Duncan. <laughs> Justin Ong. G. <laughs> Lee. <laughs> Haley Poon. <laughs> Catherine Wong. Jane Chan. Gabriel Bernard Albano. Alan Keith Tan Vicencio. Josue Gonzalez. Gregory Alexander Lopez. <laughs> Tanya Bitcon. <laughs> Daniel Ong. <laughs> Ariel Flores. Let me congratulate Environmental Science, Class of 2012. Thank you. Thank you, parents. Thank you, family. Wait one minute. There are still two things, two things to be done. Okay, you can stay standing, you can stay standing, okay. First of all, you get, this is a big treat that you've been waiting four years and hundreds of thousands of dollars for. You can now flip your tassels to the other side. And finally, last thing, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the graduating class of the UCLA Institute of Environment and Sustainability 2012, give it up for them! Much. Please allow the, uh, l allow the students and the uh, faculty to leave and then we can celebrate afterwards. Thank you.
It's a magic number. Yes, it is. It's a magic number. Because two times three is six. Three times six is eighteen. And the eighteenth letter in the alphabet is I. Yeah. You got three arms. We're gonna talk about two. We got to learn to reduce, reuse, recycle. 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 Yeah. You go to the market to buy some juice. You gotta bring your own bags and you learn to reduce your waste. We got to learn to reduce. And if your brother or your sister's got some cool clothes, you can try them on before you buy some more of those reuse. We got to learn to reuse. And if the first two arms don't work out, and if you gotta make some trash, well don't throw it out. Recycle. We got to learn to recycle. We got to learn to reduce. It's a magic number. Yes, it is. It's a magic number. It's a magic number. 